Hi, this is Peter Knetsch with Medievalist.net, and we are on the beautiful campus of uh, Hellenic College of Holy Cross here in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, and we're here for the uh, Byzantine, uh, annual Byzantine conference. Um, I'm here with Maria Kurum uh, Mali, <laughs> <Did that's laughs> that who is from this uh, campus, she was one of the organizers, and could you tell us more about the, um, the North American Byzantine mm -hmm. Studies Association and the annual conference? Yeah, you? thank you. Um, well, um, this is the 38th annual Byzantine Studies uh, Conference. Um, the Byzantine Studies Association of North America um, has hosted um, this conference for 38 years mm -hmm. now. Um, it takes place each year on a different uh, university campus. Um, um, the overseeing uh, body is the Byzantine Studies Association of North America, but each time um, a local committee is formed by members of the university hosting, actually uh, hosting the conference. So this year, um, last year actually, we were asked to um, take on this job, and um, thanks to our newly established Centre of Mary Jo Harris uh, Center for Byzantine Art and Culture. Uh, we did have the funding, of which I am the director. Uh, we had the funding to be able to put on this conference, so it's taking now place here. It was a very auspicious sort of request because we're celebrating 75 years of Hellenic College Holy Cross. So um, this is part of our anniversary celebrations as well. And I am the chair of the local arrangements committee for this conference. So. Uh, like, what's, uh, Put the blame on me. Oh, right. Well, so, <laughs> so far, I've seen it's been pretty good. So, the, the, how, like, what not, like, there are, uh, how many kind of scholars have arrived here to kind of uh, speak on the various different topics? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, actually, we had a very high registration number. Um, usually on the East Coast, of course, we do get more attendance than uh, when it's taking place um, in the Midwest or um, the West Coast. Uh, but this year we actually had uh, 265 people register. Um, unfortunately, of course, we also had Hurricane Sandy, and that did affect um, the attendance. So in terms of actual cancellations, I think perhaps maybe 30, 40 people uh, cancelled formally. Uh, but I would say we have approximately 200 uh, people on campus, uh, from what I could see from the registration folders. The, uh... I see, like from the conference program, there's like a wide range of papers, mm -hmm. and you, you yourself are giving a paper that yes. kind of deals with like, the Arab Justinian. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Um, well, uh, my specialty is um, the sixth century. Um, I wrote my thesis on uh, Procopius of Caesarea, who is the main historical source for the reign of Justinian. And of course, Justinian is well known um, not only to Byzantinists but also to uh, other uh, people in the broader field of medieval um, studies because, um, of course, we have the great church of St. Sophia in um, Constantinople, modern Istanbul, uh, which he built. Um, he had a far, uh, far-reaching far activities, uh, revision of legislation, which is still the foundation of um, European law. It's still taught in law schools. So actually, um, uh, I worked on an emperor and a historian who are more or less familiar names. Um, I, my specific research focused on um, the campaigns of Justinian against the Ostrogoths in Italy, uh, which is always part of this grand reconquest of the West that is attributed to Justinian, the sort of recapturing of the parts of the Roman Empire that had been lost to the barbarian tribes. So that really is my area of research. Um, today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about those foreign policy priorities and what we can discern from um, the various literary sources, not Procopius, um, about uh, Justinian's policies and priorities. Um, and uh, I'm uh, scheduled to publish uh, my monograph with Cambridge University Press, uh, hopefully at the end of the next year. Congratulations, Thank yeah. You. Now, bit like, Byzantine studies is kind of part of the study of the Middle Ages and medieval mm -hmm. history. But it's also a little on the uh, separate. Just uh, and could you just kind of talk about like about the you know uh, what's unique about Byzantine studies and kind of the medieval studies kind of uh, medieval verse? I would say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, um, nowadays it's not as sort of on the fringe as it used to be. I would say ten or even fifteen years ago. 
Um, more people have heard about Byzantium, of course, in the United States through the big exhibitions that have been organized at the Metropolitan Museum um, and the current big exhibitions that are being organized. Um, in Europe, um, they were on the periphery of uh, Western scholarship because, of course, when we speak about medieval studies, people think of the medieval West. So the Middle Ages, uh, totally Western Europe, and not really what's going on down there with those Greek-speaking yes, heretics yes, exactly. um, in the East. Um, but of course, uh, for those of us in the field of Byzantine studies, um, we perceive medieval studies, we used to perceive at least medieval studies in the same way. Yeah. Uh, what are those Latin-speaking heretics doing? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, I have to say that from my personal experience, attendance at various conferences and generally in, uh, from uh, discussions with colleagues, um, that gap is beginning to uh, be bridged a little bit. Um, there are Western medievalist scholars who are um, becoming aware of the parallel developments of various topics and themes in Byzantium and vice versa. So I myself, uh, having researched the topic that has to do with the Western part of the empire, which is Italy, uh, was I think more conscious of this. Um, I have always been um, alert to the Western sort of, let's say, medieval uh, perspective. Uh, but I think there still um, is quite a lot of work to be done so that both sides of the spectrum understand that actually we're talking about one medieval world with various um, manifestations and that we need to be alert in the same way that, um, you know, uh, Islamic studies or um, Judaism um, in the medieval period is becoming more prominent and people are beginning to look at the interrelation between, let's say, Byzantium and Islam, and um, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity in the medieval period. So I think we're moving towards a broader understanding of the term medieval studies. But I think in many, the average person uh, who is just entering the field, I think Byzantium is still on the fringe. It, it has a kind of foreign element because you kind of when we, you kind of grow as an undergraduate you get you read studies of people coming to Constantinople mm -hmm. but there are a huge amount of uh, literature coming out and research coming out about things from architecture mm -hmm. religion um, you know the historiographical works like you, you do the, the influence that the mm -hmm. Constantinople and Byzantium had on the West and the East and everywhere around. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think in some respects this is due to political and historical circumstances of the contemporary world, mm -hmm. really. Because, of course, um, the West, um, sort of, and when I say the West, I mean really the sort of English-speaking countries like England and the United States, and perhaps, okay, Germany and France, um, they obviously grew out of this Western medieval mm -hmm. world. Um, those states were the precursors of the modern states, whereas, of course, the eastern uh, part of the empire, when it fell to the Ottomans in uh, 1453, uh, was isolated from all these developments from the mid-15th century onwards. So um, that was what created the divide, that's what's made all these prejudices sort of come uh, forward. Um, whereas, in fact, of course, from, if you're based in an eastern European country, or in the Balkans, or in Turkey, you're far more likely to view it the other way around, because all the, the your literature, history, historical training, the curriculum in schools is focusing on the Eastern Roman Empire rather than the West. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, myself being Greek, um, I had the, t the different. You are Greek. <laughs> yes, um, I have a different perspective. Um, and the West is the foreign element to me. That's the thing I had to study to discover because, of course, um, Byzantium or the Eastern Roman Empire was part of my uh, personal cultural background. Um, so I think um, that is the reason why people perceive in the West the foreign element because, of course, it's a Greek-speaking empire in terms of output, but also not just Greek-speaking, of course, we have Syriac, we have classical Arabic when the Arabs come in. Uh, we have all these other languages and not Latin, of course. So there's this proliferation, the difficulty of learning these languages. There's also Georgian, 
um, Church, Slavonic, Armenian, Armenian yeah. all these complicated languages that people have to spend years studying in order to be able to read the primary uh, source material rather than just get away with Latin. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is effectively what happens in Western medieval studies. So I think the complexity and the, the length of time required to study in depth is what uh, has also uh, limited the intake um, of, of, uh, in the field. Well, you know, uh, with conferences like this, I think, and the research that, uh, that everyone's producing, I think that's going to kind of change, and I think we're going to see it uh, a lot more in the mainstream, I guess. Well, we're hoping. I mean, this is the main um, conference of the Byzantine Studies Association in North America. So, of course, in our field, it uh, holds a very prominent position. Um, there's an equivalent in the United Kingdom that happens in the spring, and then really the other big event is the International Conference of Byzantine Studies that happens every five years in a different country, um, again operating on the same basis. And there is an international committee of Byzantine Studies, of course, uh, where members of various countries represent the national committees of Byzantine Studies. And uh, many of those members are also members of medieval studies organizations, have uh, representations at uh, Kalamazoo and Leeds, uh, the big conferences. They collaborate on an individual basis, but it's still limited to individuals rather than collaborated, collective, um, sort of, um, you know, uh, proposals that would build, um, you know, foster a, a sort of understanding of uh, both sides of the spectrum. But uh, being based in Oxford for many years before I came here, I have to say that there people were more alert, and there was a lot, more, uh, there was a lot of collaboration uh, between uh, Western medievalists and Byzantinists, and there was an effort to sort of become more aware of the other perspective. But again, you can only research so much. I mean, everybody yeah. specializes. It's impossible to be an expert on everything. But a conference like this is is extremely. Um, fascinating from the perspective of the Byzantines because we get to hear so many papers on every aspect, history, uh, literature, uh, theology, art, yeah. and archaeology. So, you know, it's really a very rich sort of two and a half days. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing what I can and thank you again for having us here. Oh, pleased to have you. Very glad you could make it. Thanks. Thank you.